Kerjasama internasional yang mapan juga terjalin dengan puluhan institusi luar negeri telah dituangkan melalui double degree program, student exchange, dan juga collaboration research. Transformasi besar satu dekade yang telah berhasil membawa Universitas Bakri di tahun 2021 sebagai perguruan tinggi swasta kedua terbaik se-Indonesia. Universitas Bakri berhasil meraih peringkat ke-138 dari 5.116 affiliation yang tercatat dalam database Scientific and Technology Index ditandai oleh keberhasilan para dosen dalam meraih pendanaan penelitian nasional dan World Research Grant dari pemerintah Indonesia. Untuk meningkatkan daya saing bangsa, kelompok usaha Bakri mendukung penuh Universitas Bakri di dalam proses perkuliahan, penelitian, dan inovasi. Melalui kolaborasi yang erat, bersama-sama kami siap menghasilkan sumber daya manusia yang unggul. Sebagai industrial university yang menerapkan metode experiential learning, Universitas Bakri memiliki jaringan kerjasama dengan berbagai instansi, universitas, dan berbagai sektor industri dari dalam dan luar negeri. Mahasiswa tidak hanya akan berinteraksi dengan para pengajar, tetapi juga dengan para tokoh nasional dan internasional, praktisi, serta para CEO dan jajaran direksi di dalam kelompok usaha Bakri. Saya memilih Universitas Bakri karena dihadapkan dengan dua pilihan, apakah mau menjadi seorang followers atau menjadi seorang leaders. Dan saya memilih untuk menjadi seorang leaders. Universitas Bakri membekali saya kualitas pendidikan yang luar biasa dari para dosen, dan ini yang menjadikan saya seorang entrepreneur sejati. Berlokasi di lingkungan yang sangat strategis, terletak di epicentrum kota Jakarta, semakin meningkatkan mobilitas dan kesempatan para mahasiswa untuk merasakan pengalaman langsung berinteraksi dengan beragam stakeholders. Universitas Bakri juga menunjang pembentukan karakter dengan nilai profesional, caring, dan inovatif. Dengan unit kegiatan mahasiswa yang mengasah keterampilan mahasiswa untuk mengikuti kompetisi pada tingkat lokal, nasional, maupun internasional. Pendidikan yang berkualitas dan menghasilkan para lulusan yang memiliki jiwa kewirausahaan dan inovator yang kreatif tanpa batasan bisa memimpin lapangan pekerjaan di dalam negeri maupun di luar negeri hanya bisa didapatkan di Universitas Bakri. Didasari cita-cita membentuk SDM yang unggul, Universitas Bakri merupakan ekosistem akademik yang mendukung setiap mahasiswanya untuk terus meraih berbagai prestasi dan siap mengantarkan untuk menciptakan inovasi serta solusi bagi Indonesia dan dunia. Universitas Bakri, experience the real things. Kita akan memulai acara pada pagi hari ini. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Yang terhormat, Mr. Charles Chauvel, Global Lead Inclusive Processes and Institution of UNDP. 
Yang terhormat Bapak Aditya Batara Gunawan, selaku Kaprodi Ilmu Politik Universitas Bakri, seluruh peserta Zoom, mahasiswa, dosen, dan lainnya, selamat pagi dan selamat bergabung pada acara pagi hari ini. A very good morning to His Excellency, Global Lead Inclusive Processes and Institution of UNDP, Mr. Charles Chauvel, to eminent head of political science department, Bapak Aditya Batara Gunawan, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to the public lecture, increasing students' awareness of the sustainable development goals and the importance of academics working together for a better future. Senang sekali saya bisa hadir di tengah-tengah kalian untuk memandu acara pada pagi hari ini. Perkenalkan saya Nia yang akan memandu public lecture ini. Diharapkan nantinya kegiatan ini bisa membuka horizon pengetahuan kita dan juga awareness kita terhadap agenda SGD dan bagaimana implikasinya terhadap dunia pendidikan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that it's such an honor to be amongst the company of all over here. And of course, welcome to the public lecture, increasing student awareness of the sustainable development goals and the importance of academics working together for a better future. Um, baiklah, peserta Zoom, uh, kegiatan ini seharusnya dibuka oleh Bapak Wakil Rektor, namun beliau akan segera bergabung di tengah-tengah kita. Sebelum kita nantinya mendengar remarks dari Bapak Wakil Rektor, mungkin kita bisa uh, langsung ke agenda acara ya Pak ya, Pak Adit mungkin. Ya, ya. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I always... I also would like to inform you that we are now live on YouTube at Universitas Bakri. So, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's time to ask to come to our very main agenda. There will be a discussion session and there will be a presentation from Mr. Charles Chopel and will be moderated by Bapak Aditya Batara. And he is already here with us. And without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me and join me in welcoming Bapak Aditya Batara. Over to you, Pak. Thank you, uh, Nia. Good morning, students, fellow lecturers and staffs. Welcome to Bakri University Public Lectures. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Aditya from the Political Science Department, and I'll be responsible for hosting the presentation and our discussion today with our distinguished speaker. Um, let me remind you a little bit, please turn off your microphone during the event and turn on your camera if possible. We will have approximately 30 minutes to hear presentations from Mr. Uh, Shoffel here. And after that, we will proceed with the questions and answer sessions. If you have any questions for Mr. Shoffel, please write it on the chat room. You can use Bahasa or English, don't worry. Uh, we will translate the questions for you. Now, uh, let me greet our main speaker today. Mr. Schaufel, are you with us? I am indeed. <clears throat> okay, cool then. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much okay. for inviting me. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are so delighted that you could be here uh, this morning to share your insights about uh, the importance of higher education community contribution for SDGs. Uh, especially for our university that currently aims to improve our engagement with the SDGs issues in Indonesia. So before uh, Mr. Shoffel delivers his presentations, maybe uh, let me briefly introduce his background for our reference. Um, Mr. Shoffel is the Global Lead on Inclusive uh, Institutions and Process at the UNDP uh, regional hub in Bangkok since 2019. And before, uh, I'm sorry, he joined the UNDP in 2013 and took some key positions in the UNDP country office in Laos Democratic Republic, and also at the UNDP multi-country office in Samoa. Prior to his UN professional career, he was a politician. Wow, that's really interesting, Mr. Shalpo. <laughs> so you serve, he served at the uh, as a parliamentarian at the New Zealand Parliament, yeah, member of the House of Representatives. Interesting. And for educational background, Mr. Shoffel holds a Bachelor of Laws with honors from Victoria University in Wellington and a Master of Jurisprudence with distinction from the University of Auckland. That's all. Uh, so, Mr. Shoffel, without further ado, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Aditya, for that very generous uh, introduction. 
members of the university, thank you for uh, attending this public lecture in such gratifying numbers. I hope that uh, what I have to say will be of sufficient interest uh, to repay your interest uh, in attending and, and listening. Now, what I would like to do is run through a prepared PowerPoint presentation. It doesn't have a lot of words in it. It's largely um, graphical, and I'll, I'll try to speak to the, the graphics and interpret them as I go. Uh, may I just ask, Aditya, will you and your colleagues control that, or would you like yeah. to allow yeah. me to share the screen so I can do it? You just tell me which is better. Okay, uh, so we have your file. Is it okay if we help you? Okay. Absolutely. So you, you, yeah. you, if you, if you don't mind running through it, and I'll just say, you know, next slide when I'm ready. Uh, let me just bring it up on my computer so that I can sort of follow where we're going. If you just give me one moment. <clears throat> okay. So. Um, Perhaps if we go straight to slide two, which is a graphic of the sustainable development goals. Now, uh, colleagues, I don't know how much you know about the goals. Uh, so forgive me if I'm telling you things you already know, but I'll just give you a very brief introduction. So for many years, the international uh, development community has been trying to uh, find a coherent framework uh, by which member states of the United Nations can come together to try to eliminate extreme poverty around the world, uh, to eliminate extreme inequality, and to deal with other global challenges. Some of you will know about the Millennium Development Goals, which were agreed way back in the 1990s. I'm sure to many of you that feels like ancient history. Uh, that was a set of goals uh, designed to uh, try to accomplish this, this end. In 2015, world leaders, including the head of state of Indonesia, uh, and let me say Indonesia played an incredibly important role uh, on behalf of the Global South in the formation of what became the Sustainable Development Goals. World leaders came together in New York uh, and they agreed what was called the uh, 2030 declaration. So September 2015, they looked ahead 15 years. They looked back at the Millennium Development Goals and the lessons that they'd learned from that, and they agreed a new set of goals. And the agreement was that these goals would be incorporated into national development plans, and the world would try to pull together uh, to achieve the uh, aims set out in the goals. There are 17 goals. They appear on your screen now. And, and let, me just, let me just make three important points about how these goals differ to what came before. First of all, uh, there was a, a real attempt not just to look at economic and social progress, uh, although those were obviously very important and many of the goals uh, deal expressly with those matters. But there was also an attempt to recognize environmental and climate issues, to, to realize that we cannot just keep growing and growing and growing at the expense of planetary limits. And so for the first time uh, in an international binding document, coincidentally in the same year as the, as the Paris Climate Conference, uh, there was a, an incorporation into the Sustainable Development Goals of uh, targets around clean air, clean water, climate action, life on land. This was a very, very significant uh, departure for the international community. It hadn't been done before. The second major department, departure of the goals uh, appears in goal 16. This was a, a recognition that unless you have peace, justice, and good governance, it's very difficult to achieve goals like eliminating poverty, eliminating inequality, achieving gender equality, dealing with environmental degradation. So yes, peace, uh, justice, and good governance in and of itself 
will not achieve these things. But if you don't have the internal conditions for good governance and administration, peace inside the country, and people feeling a sense of justice and community, you really don't have any chance of getting to achieve the goals themselves as a whole. And then I think the final point about the SDGs is that there was a unanimous agreement uh, by heads of state and government in New York to their adoption and their incorporation uh, into uh, development plans and a recognition for the first time that governments themselves couldn't achieve the goals within the 15 year time frame allotted to them. They needed the private sector, they needed parliament, they needed civil society, they needed religious and community leaders, they needed universities and academics all to pull together uh, as part of the international effort to achieve them. So I think that's what I want to say about the goals. Let me talk a little bit now about UNDP. Uh, if we go to slide three, um, this is just a graphic to show you, I think, to, to make two points. First of all, the United Nations Development Program uh, was, was put together by member states in the 1960s in recognition that the United Nations needed a development arm, an arm to deal with poverty, inequality, environmental degradation, poor governance, needed to work with member states to, to, to really improve on these issues. And, and you can see that UNDP is probably, along with organizations like UNICEF, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's global in its reach. We, we are represented in 170 countries and territories, and we actively program in those countries in partnership uh, with governments, civil society, and other entities. And Indonesia, again, has been probably one of our most uh, generous and um, productive partners uh, in the global south. So there's the breadth of our programming. Next slide, number four. So what is it that we do? This is a graphic that will try to show you um, that we have these six, what we call signature solutions, right at the left-hand side, poverty and inequality, dealing with that good governance, promoting resilience, especially uh, from climate shocks and crises, wars, uh, conflicts, um, working to improve environmental outcomes, helping to bring clean energy to countries and communities, and, and on a cross-cutting basis, dealing with gender equality, making sure that unless we make sure that women and girls and other uh, gender and sexual minorities are not included uh, in the push for development, uh, then we, you know, we, we recognize that we, we will fail. So it's such an important inclusion. Then moving through the, the diagram, uh, how, do we, how do we program? We, we, we try to use digital uh, opportunities whenever we can. We try to innovate strategically, borrowing ideas from, from, from all around. And we try to find new ways to finance all of this because uh, you know, it's estimated that we, we basically need $2 trillion every year of extra expenditure to help countries reach the SDGs. And I think what, what that sort of shows you is that there's these directions of change, building resilience, structural transformation, leaving no one behind through these enabling actions and through these signature solutions, that's how we do what we try to do in respect of the goals. Next slide, number five, there, there's a close up. You know, you, you can't achieve this sort of change through little, little bits of programming. You've got to, you've got to work with, with, with member states to, to really work on structural and systems change. Um, culture change, if, if there's corruption, for example, you have to help people understand how this impedes human development and, 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 and how it can be successfully dealt with, eliminated, uh, and, and, and you can get really good service delivery as a result. Leaving no one behind, I said you know, before, for example, if we don't have women and girls fully behind the, the effort, we don't have 51% of the population forget it, we're never going to actually achieve inclusive growth. 
uh, building resilience. You know, if there's a if there's a tidal wave, a tsunami, an earthquake, you don't want to just go in and give aid to the community that's affected and then go away again. What you want to do is you go in, you work with the community, you help them build their own responses, their own resilience. So not only are you helping them recover from the crisis, you're helping them to build back better, to make sure that next time there's a tsunami, they've actually got community defences in place and a recovery plan so that they can help themselves rather than relying on somebody coming in from the outside. Next slide, number six. I mentioned the signature solutions in the previous diagram. I won't go through them again. Uh, those are the six key areas where we've identified uh, that we can make a contribution to achieve the SDGs. Next slide, number seven. I mentioned again the enablers in, in the previous diagram. You know, the, in the course of my lifetime, I'm 52. When I was at university uh, back in the, well, I finished my, my, my master's degree in, in the mid-1990s, we still used fax machines and email uh, wasn't really something that people were terribly familiar with. Think about the, the differences in scale and efficiency that going online and, and, and using the digital opportunities that we have have made in terms of the ability to deliver quality uh, and, 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 and to enrich people's lives. Now, it's not an unqualified good. You know, we've seen with the COVID pandemic that a lot of dialogue has moved online because people haven't been speaking to each other in person. And we've seen a lot of hate speech, a lot of disinformation, a lot of lies being amplified and spread through social media platforms, not just about COVID, but about a whole range of things. So we, we, we know that there's a danger in digitalization as well as huge promise. It has, it, it's like electricity, you know, it, it's greatly beneficial, but it can electrocute you unless you use it the right way and have the right tools to deal with it. So that's a really important part of, of our empowerment of, of, of governments and other partners. Strategic innovation, you know, this is really just a, a cheeky way in English, I think, of saying that we're like magpies, you know, we steal and borrow good ideas whenever we find them, including from universities. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to this point again, but basically there's a, there's a world out there, partly thanks to digitalization, because that's what helps us know about this. You know, there, there, are, there are kids building websites uh, that are, far more effective and, and powerful than things that are coming out of Silicon Valley. Bringing all this innovation together in, and, 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 and channeling it for sustainable human development is a challenge, but also an opportunity like we've never seen before. And finally, development financing. As I said before, you know, we need to find $2 trillion extra every year to help countries reach the goals. It's probably more than that, thanks to the retardant effect of COVID, and I'll, I'll come back to that point later. So it isn't just enough to rely on traditional aid or charity uh, or, 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 or ways of financing development in the past. We need to find new ways and effective ways to finance uh, the achievement of the goals. Okay, so next slide, number eight. The, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Declaration, expressly recognises that all these partners, member states, UN agencies, international financial institutions like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the Asian Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, all these entities that Indonesia is a, is a strong and contributing member of, uh, civil society and NGOs, the private sector, and academia all need to be working together in partnership to achieve the goals. Otherwise, we have no chance of doing so. Now, slide number nine, this is, and I need, because I'm speaking to university to avoid any chance of being accused of plagiarizing. I didn't create this, um, uh, uh, this slide. This was created, I believe, by at one of the universities in Bangladesh, 
when they were considering the kind of circular knowledge exchange that was made possible by SDGs. But I think it's helpful from the point of view of today's discussion, because you see, it is a, it is a kind of circular um, scenario. We, universities help us and governments achieve the SDGs because you are the, you are the source, the cutting edge of knowledge. You're the place where research is going on. You, you, you're doing things uh, that we probably just dream about in our offices at the UN. And, 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 and we need your knowledge and your know-how and the solutions that you're coming up with across a range of disciplines in order to do what we do. You know, every country, as I said before, is encouraged to incorporate the SDGs and all the goals and targets that sit underneath them into their national development plans. Indonesia's done so. We've been working with the parliament to help them monitor uh, the way in which the government is achieving the SDGs. And the tools that you can help come up with to help the parliament, to help the Supreme Audit Institution, to help civil society, and help government work out whether or not the way they're measuring the achievement of human development is actually accurate and, and appropriate, is vital. Uh, I think there's, a, there's an issue about living the SDGs, you know, as a university, a large learning institution, you as faculty members and students can model the SDGs. Is the university uh, a place where people can speak freely? Is, there, is it a peaceful uh, place where, where everybody feels that they are collaborating in a constructive way? Uh, is it a place where uh, people feel that there is justice and inclusion? You know, modeling uh, the, 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 the values of the, of the goals. Is there equality in the institution? This is a challenge as much to the university as it is to you an institution such as mine. And this idea of cross-sectoral leadership to guide the SDG response, you know, it's very easy for somebody like me in my UN job as a former politician, a former partner in a law firm to think, oh, okay, my job is SDG 16, peace, justice, good governance. It's not gender equality, it's not poverty elimination, it's not climate, it's not quality jobs. Well, that's nonsense. And having the universities remind us of the cross-sectoral nature of development and the importance of always thinking holistically rather than in silos is absolutely vital. I think on the other side, there are ways in which the universities can be assisted by the SDGs. There's a, uh, you know, there's a there's there's an important knowledge dissemination opportunity here about what the SDGs mean. The universities, the university community globally, helps us always redefine and keep relevant uh, the issue of uh, our understanding of the SDGs. They're not set in stone how they were proclaimed in 2015 and how they're now understood uh, has, been the, has benefited from uh, you know, seven years of experience and implementation. And universities with their research and, 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 and knowledge collation and dissemination capability are key to ensuring that we know and understand and can share and, and benefit from this experience. I think uh, the ability to create new funding streams and support collaboration with new external and internal partners is also very important. And I'm going to come, going to, come to that as I, I wrap up my remarks and, and invite questions. So let us go to uh, slide 10. Here's, the, here's where I want to kind of finish my, my remarks. Thanks to COVID, let me, go, let me go back a bit. One of the great kind of triumphs of our international efforts and the efforts of governments uh, from about the 1990s onwards is that every year we've seen the world lift tens 
twenties, you know, millions of people out of poverty, and it's happened consistently. Thanks to COVID, uh, in the last two years, we've seen the first reversal in sustainable human development uh, in modern human history. We've actually seen the number of people living in poverty rising for the first time uh, since 1998. And that is, that is due to COVID. I've mentioned the digital divide, the promise of digital uh, capability, but also the dangers that it brings, and the fact that you know it's uneven. People in cities, folk like yourselves in Jakarta, you've probably got wonderful high-speed internet. You, you probably can do all sorts of amazing things. In a village in Aceh, things might be very, very different. And it's important to make sure that, that we, we deal with that unevenness, as well as exploit the benefits and deal with the dangers of online engagement. Climate. We're at a tipping point. We all know that if this uh, the COP meeting in Glasgow in two weeks' time doesn't deliver hard targets agreed to by nations to limit emissions, we are particularly in countries such as Thailand, where I am at the moment, Indonesia, where you are, equatorial countries where there's you know, islands with, 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 with huge coastlines, the, the, the threat of increased disaster and long-term risk is extreme. And we just have to deal with this, with this problem. Complex and, and protracted conflicts. You know, we, we've moved again from a, a, a paradigm, I think, where um, conflicts used to be quite easy. They were between colonial powers and countries striving for independence, or they were between you know, neighboring countries with, with border conflicts. Things are so much more com complex now. Look at, look at Afghanistan, for example, and the mess that's been made there by successive foreign occupations. Uh, you see now uh, a country that is uh, ostensibly governed by a particular entity, the Taliban, but then you've got ISK, which has very different ideas. Uh, this, is a, this is an incredibly complex uh, conflict. It's, it, it's not amenable to traditional means of settlement. This leads to multilateral fragmentation. We are in a time of huge opportunity and choices. And I think without sounding patronizing as an older person, you as people now in your university careers are moving into an incredibly complex world, but you have an opportunity to make such a difference if you understand and grasp some of these challenges and can fit your talents uh, to helping find solutions to them. I, I do have a couple more slides, but I, I think in the time available, I'd like to stop now and invite your comments uh, on the scenarios and the uh, and, and, and the kind of background that I've tried to give on the goals, the origin, the need for collaboration on them, the challenges that we face, and some of the opportunities that you as members of the university have to help in this vital task. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shuffle. Amazing presentations. Now, um, if any of the participants has any questions, please raise your hand, or maybe you can write it down uh, on the chat room. But, okay, maybe before that, Mr. Shuffle, I highlight some interesting points in your presentations. First, you said about how peace and justice becomes one of the most, uh, how do you say, it's crucial, but not dominant. Uh, for the SDGs implementations. And <clears throat> if we try to see it uh, from the Southeast Asian perspectives, um, is the SDGs number 16 um, is still a big issue for countries in Southeast Asians uh, based on your observations? It is. I mean, let me... Let, let me... Let me perhaps point to 
two ends of the extreme to, to make the point. Um, in the region, we have an, an open conflict in Myanmar at the moment. Uh, you know, it's essentially a civil war. My colleagues can't leave their offices to do their jobs because it's too dangerous. A democratically elected regime has been overthrown by a military that has huge economic interests that are threatened by greater democracy and participation. Now, the regime thinks, as do its geopolitical backers, that it doesn't need inclusion and democracy. It doesn't need a mandate. It can follow the authoritarian model. It can try and find foreign direct investment from its backers. Uh, and hopefully the country will develop that way. My own view, and it is a personal view because UN officials don't comment on the internal politics of uh, member states from an official perspective, but history tells us that this model is likely to fail because it doesn't have buy-in from people. There's huge opposition to it. Nobody feels, nobody particularly feels included uh, in the efforts of the regime. And while there's a, a profit-taking approach on the part of the military, you know, it owns huge swathes of the economy from the pharmaceutical industry uh, through to military and, and other procurement. If the aim of a government is simply to take profit from the country without expressly improving the lives of the citizens, you simply aren't going to see human development. So there's a, there's a gross example of why SDG 16 is important. And, and, you know, may I just say, I was so heartened by the decision by ASEAN to decline to allow the military regime to attend uh, the coming leaders summit. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly brave move for an organization that's always been very cautious about uh, the need for internal consensus and, and persuasion. But it's a very, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great signal that, you know, in this region, it's no longer possible just to keep overthrowing a democratic government and, and experiencing no consequences. At, at the other end of the scale, you know, um, you, you, I won't name countries, but there are countries in the region that look like democracies. They have regular elections. Um, they may even have achieved a, a degree of prosperity. But there's no real ongoing feeling of participation or um, involvement by large sections of the population uh, in, the, in the ongoing welfare of the country. So again, unless you have, th th there's no conflict here, there's no war, there's no, uh, there's no great um, uh, there's, 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 there's no sense of armed conflict in the traditional sense. There's just a huge sense of exclusion on the part of large parts of the population. Now, those states are equally doomed to slower economic, social, and environmental growth, simply by virtue of the fact that they haven't achieved proper internal peace, justice, and inclusion. And because they don't and can't harness the efforts of all the population, the way that they would if they were more open to such inclusion. So I think I, I think the, the, there are living examples of why SDG 16 is so important, not as a solution to everything, but as a fundamental precondition to getting to good, sustainable human development outcomes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shoffel, for your answer. So uh, we're glad to see how the ASEAN countries now acting against Myanmar, yeah, and we hopefully we can see uh, more assertive actions uh, in order to create a peaceful situations in Myanmar. 
Um, next, uh, we, do we have any more questions from the participants? Uh, you can raise your hands. Ah, we have Grace, Angelia. Please, Grace, you can ask directly to Mr. Shaw. Hello. Hi, Grace. Hi, Mr. Charles. Kia ora. Hello. Ora. Yeah, kia ora. I would like to ask, um, could you please tell us which part of the 17 goals in the SDA and in the in the in the SDGs is the most urgent in terms of raising student awareness and why? Thank you. Sorry, I, there was a slight problem with the audio. Just repeat the question. Which of the 17 goals is is the most urgent? in the most urgent in terms of raising student awareness and why. Thank you. Is that clear, Mr. Charles? It is, yeah, thank you. I'm going to speak about um, goal 17, which nobody ever talks about, but <laughs> maybe because it comes right at the end and they've got so tired reading <laughs> the, the, the rest of the 16. But goal 17 is the partnerships goal. And maybe I should have mentioned it in my introduction when I said that the SDGs were such a, a new departure because, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned the environmental aspects. I mentioned the, you know, the holistic um, importance of, of all sectors. And I mentioned the governance goal, all, all new things. But, you know, goal 17 talks about partnerships. And I think it's... it's its potential over the next eight years to get us to where we need to go in terms of the of, of the totality of the goals is, is much much neglected. You know, uh, I mentioned the need for finance. It's, it's not just about money. I mean, money's important, obviously, but you know, Denmark, great example of what I'm about to, to say, and. I, I prefer not to use Global North examples, but they've just done such a good job that I will. When the, when the SDGs were first um, promulgated, yeah. the Danish parliament decided that there should be a national coordinating committee and it should have MPs, civil society, um, business leaders, senior academic representatives, um, you know, a, a very representative group from across society. And this group should be instrumental in commenting on how the government brought the SDGs and its targets into their national development planning so that it wouldn't just be about what government would do, it would be about what all those other entities would do. And yes, their money and their financial contributions would be important, uh, because as I say, you know, without that extra billion a year, it's going to be difficult to achieve. But their know-how, their expertise, their experience, you know, think about the impact of a, of a major multinational, a big employer in a country. Think about uh, the impact of that company saying, okay, we are going to live and breathe the SDGs. We're going to model uh, the uh, the values of the SDGs um, body. We're going to employ kids or interns or, or, or junior staff, and we're going to sponsor these people to work in countries uh, of greatest need. You know, it's not just about governments; it's about these partnerships that matter so much. And and you know, to come back to the Indonesian example the possibilities of Islamic finance uh, and the, um, the adaptability of the models that we've seen through, uh, through that vector have, have, have opened up huge opportunities uh, for financing the goals that we never knew about or thought about as, you know, as Westerners with no experience of, of such things. So um, I think in terms of your potential impact as members of the university, as young, young people coming into society, really focusing on the partnerships goal and how you can, you can think globally, act locally and respond personally 
to really make those partnerships work uh, with a view to achieving the goals, not only in your ordinary lives as a first step, uh, but in, in, in the things that the organizations you belong to also do. Okay, Grace, you know? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chalice. Thank you very much, Mr. Shoffer. And I guess we still have one question. Did someone ask me? Uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, Miss Rini, yeah. Okay, Miss Rini is one of our faculty yeah, members. Hello, Please, you can. I'm Mr. Aditya. Aditya, thank you for the um, opportunity. Uh, Mr. Chalo Sovel, nice to see you again. I think um, um, my professor, yeah, I think uh, he kind of mentioned about uh, the work of the United National Development uh, Program before. And especially Dr. Tao, yeah, he really likes to mention about uh, uh, when I was um, learning yes, um, at university. It was um, still Millennium, yeah, Millennium Goals but now is the SDG. So um, especially during pandemic in Indonesia, I would like to ask you, um, because we have a lot of uh, online workers and also um, food, small business um, people that uh, uh, really try to um, give um, uh, food like that to their family and then we try to make uh, more money during pandemic, um, mm. but they really work hard for that. And especially for my students also, they have their own um, small business uh, um, uh, kind of projects too. So uh, what I would like to ask, uh, whether you uh, uh, familiar with our uh, um, online small businesses program, and is, uh, are there any uh, kind of uh, assistance that uh, UNDP could help uh, in our uh, country? Because uh, that's actually um, really a practical uh, job that, and also uh, money that we can uh, earn during pandemic. So um, <laughs> in terms of zero hunger yeah, uh, program, uh, it uh, actually really uh, could help us like that. Um, rather than, uh, for example, to go to uh, the government because the government may not know what happened uh, in, uh, down here. Like um, the people really <laughs> try to make them sneeze. That's all. So um, is there any kind of uh, program that uh, suitable in that, uh, those kind of areas that you know? So um, uh, thank you. Um, have a good one. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Rini. It's a good question, um, which I don't know the entire answer to, but let me make perhaps two points, if I may. One is, um, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's great to know about the entrepreneurial um, spirit and opportunities that you, you mentioned. SDG 8 um, talks about decent work, you know, so it's an attempt to recognize that we can't just kind of work people to, to, to the bone, uh, that if people are engaging in effort for remuneration, they need to receive uh, fair compensation for it, and they need to work under appropriate conditions. It's, it's again, I think, a, um, an example of actually how, how revolutionary the SDGs are in, in fact, because you think about the range of interests around the table uh, of all member states to get, you know, to get a kind of decent, fair work um, for or fair reward for fair work goal in there was uh, was quite an achievement. In terms of um, opportunities for funding, you know, what I would encourage you to do is is go online, have a look at the UNDP Indonesia site. One, one of the things that the organization has been trying to do for many years is be very, very transparent. 
there's if, if you google open.undp if you if you if you really wanted to go to the uh, the effort of doing so you could find a list and a and a a set of background documents of all our programming all around the world. We're very, we're very transparent. Um, in fact, we've been recognized, I think, for the last three or four years at least as the most transparent multilateral entity working anywhere in the world. The reason I mention this is if there are such opportunities, for example, through the Indonesia Country Office's Accelerator Lab or its, its impact work, uh, it's the small grants program, uh, you know, then they'll be on that website and it's really worth having a look uh, at, at what those opportunities are and what the modalities are for applying. And I'd absolutely encourage you and anybody else who's uh, in attendance to, to, to check it out. And, uh, you know, definitely it's, it's, it's worth having a look at for uh, opportunities to fund the work that you describe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shuffle, and thank you, uh, Ms. Rini, for asking. Um, perhaps uh, I have a question for Mr. Shuffle uh, on the current situations of pandemic. Um, last week, we had a program, we had a discussions with one of the main NGOs in Indonesia to give their perspective on SDGs implementations in Indonesia. And then, uh, there are some informations about possible change, or maybe we can say revocusing of SDGs in, in the post-pandemic situations. Now, um, from your perspective as a, as a UN professional who works covering the regional uh, uh, areas, how, how do you see, or is there any, any effort to, to expand the SDGs or maybe to adapt with the current pandemic or post-pandemic situation, because 2030, it's only nine years from now. <laughs> but the pandemic, we don't know. It can be until 2030. Uh, could you share that kind of a perspective uh, if, if there is any change on what, uh, on which SDGs that will be influ influenced a lot by the pandemic situations? Again, a very, uh, very perceptive question. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned in my presentation that the COVID pandemic and the economic contraction that yeah. it led to uh, represented the first reversal in human development, the consistency of human development since 1998. And the tragic irony of this is that, you know, we realised in 2018, three years in, that we were lagging behind in supporting countries to achieve most of the goals. So it was agreed in 2019 by the Security Council and the General Assembly that 2020 would be the first year of the decade of action on SDGs, and we'd really accelerate our efforts on, on development finance and on coordination to achieve the goals. Then what happened? COVID. So, you know, I can say that's why it's an extremely good question. The answer is complex because member states have justifiably been very focused on their own uh, internal COVID responses. There's been a very poor international level of coordination on issues like vaccine delivery, you know, it, it pains me greatly to see the fact that wealthy Western countries are debating whether to give booster shots, you know, the third shot to people. Whereas in Africa, you know, we have what, 8% coverage of, of people with their first shot. I mean, there's no, there's no justice in that. And it represents a failure on the part of the international community to leave no one behind, in the words of the SDGs, and to reach first those most at risk of being left behind. Now, those are fine words. I, I, uh, in terms of what action uh, is now being taken, there's enormous thought being given to how we, we boost development finance through 
for example, green bonds. I mentioned Islamic finance. Um, the ability of the international financing community to now price in externalities on climate and to effectively say to countries that want to keep burning coal, listen, you have to pay for that uh, because it's costing the entire planet. There, there are positive developments, but bringing all this together and recommitting to the SDGs it's, it's going to be a toughie. And for example, the African Union has recognised this already and said, look, for us, it's not 2030, it's 2056. So we are going to have to be real. You know, I, I remember at UN headquarters being told in 2017, oh, this is great. By, the, by 2030, if we're on track to achieve the SDGs, there'll just be six countries left in the least developed uh, category. And they'll all be in Africa and we'll be able to really just wrap lots of resources around them and, and sort it out. Well, you know, as you say, eight years out from 2030, uh, the reality is very different. And so, yes, there, 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 there's, there's, there's a recognition now of the need to redouble efforts around the SDGs, not to change them, uh, but to recalibrate, to, to, to learn some lessons to get much better financing and much better coordination and really push uh, to, uh, to, to, to kind of apply the lessons learned from COVID and make sure that we don't see yet another reversal of sustainable human development. Great. Thank you, Mr. Shuffle. So um, participants, I think it's already 12 o'clock. Uh, so, Thank you very much, Mr. Shoffer, for answering the questions uh, and for the great presentations. I'm sure we learned a lot about the importance of a higher education community role within the global SDGs. Um, I'm not going to conclude anything, but uh, you highlight or underline about the importance of collaborations and partnerships. So you start with this. The SG17, uh, just like your answers to Greece, I think this is an important message to all of us in the university. Let's start with partnership. Let's build the partnership. Uh, I think that's one of the 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 most important uh, features that can be done. Sorry, important objective that can be done by the universities, students, lecturers, and and the staff here yeah, to take part in the global SDGs. Um, and most importantly, let's contribute more for SDGs achievement in Indonesia through whatever means. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Shaful, and please uh, stay in the Zoom to all of you, the participants. We still have some agendas. Let me return uh, to Dina uh, for hosting our further events. Itu dia tadi uh, presentasi dan juga diskusi yang luar biasa dari pemateri kita pada siang hari ini. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can we please give a big round of applause for the discussion? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chofel, for the presentation and also Pak Adit for moderating the discussion. That was a very fruitful discussion. Um, dan seluruh peserta Zoom, saya ingin menginformasikan bahwa Bapak Wakil Rektor 2 Universitas Bakri sudah ada di tengah-tengah kita dan kita akan sama-sama memberikan kesempatan kepada Pak Andika untuk memberikan sambutannya. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to inform you that the Vice Rector of Universitas Bakri is already here with us and please allow me to invite the Vice Rector of Universitas Bakri to give his remarks. And so with that, help me and join me in welcoming Bapak Muhammad Ri Andika Kurniawan. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ibu Nia. And good afternoon, Mr. Shaufel. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, Rector, our Rector, Prof. Sofia Alisa Habana, we would like to say great thanks to Mr. Shaufel for being here and accepting our offer to uh, to discuss yeah, and to increase the awareness uh, our student about SDGs is because uh, sustainable development goals actually is very important agenda as part of the global community. We have uh, responsibility in person yeah, to promote uh, this issue. But unfortunately in Indonesia, uh, based on my slide observation, yeah, the awareness of students about this issue still need to be increased 
and therefore this is our effort uh, Universitas Bakri inviting Mr. Shafa from UNDP uh, to deliver uh, your experience, your expertise, and more insight about what is going to happen in uh, our agenda about sustainable development goals that should be achieved in 2030. Uh, yeah. And also because our government right now is very actively encouraged all uh, lecture and all university in Indonesia to support government agenda in implementing uh, sustainable development goals. And therefore, uh, from Bakri University, we take this issue, the SDG issue, as part of our uh, strategic framework yeah, in improving academic uh, activity and also to equip our students with the holistic uh, perspective about the SDGs. And also, we are looking for further collaboration uh, with UNDP and hopefully Mr. Schaufer, uh, even though we are, we are uh, having a, a very long distance, yeah, just in New York, but actually we are met in the one spirit to promote uh, this uh, agenda about the common goals. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaufer, for your attending. And... Uh, Thank you, Mbak Nia. Okay, thank you, Pandika, for your remarks. Seluruh peserta Zoom, kita sudah sampai pada penghujung di agenda hari ini. Terima kasih banyak uh, sudah mengikuti kegiatan dari awal hingga akhir. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the very end of our agenda today. Thank you so much for your great attention. We hope that you all find this uh, discussion very fruitful, both for your academic and also personal development. Saya Nia, dan pamit undur diri, sampai jumpa pada kegiatan berikutnya. Nia, and thank you. See you on another time. Thank you semuanya. Terima kasih. University through engagement with industries and experiential learning methods. Berawal dari Bakri School of Management yang didirikan pada tahun 2006, Universitas Bakri resmi bertransformasi menjadi salah satu universitas di Indonesia di tahun 2010 dengan 10 program studi. Saat ini, Universitas Bakri telah memiliki Magister Management Program Double Degree Program MM-MBA dan Dual Degree Program of Bachelor. Kerjasama internasional yang mapan juga terjalin dengan puluhan institusi luar negeri telah dituangkan melalui Double Degree Program, Student Exchange, dan juga Collaboration Research. Transformasi besar satu dekade yang telah berhasil membawa Universitas Bakri di tahun 2021 sebagai perguruan tinggi swasta kedua terbaik se-Indonesia. Universitas Bakri berhasil meraih peringkat ke-138 dari 5.116 affiliation yang tercatat dalam database Scientific and Technology Index, ditandai oleh keberhasilan para dosen dalam meraih pendanaan penelitian nasional dan World Research Grant dari pemerintah Indonesia. Untuk meningkatkan daya saing bangsa, kelompok usaha Bakri mendukung penuh Universitas Bakri di dalam proses perkuliahan, penelitian, dan inovasi. Melalui kolaborasi yang erat, bersama-sama kami siap menghasilkan sumber daya manusia yang unggul. Sebagai industrial university yang menerapkan metode experiential learning, Universitas Bakri memiliki jaringan kerjasama dengan berbagai instansi, universitas, dan berbagai sektor industri dari dalam dan luar negeri. Mahasiswa tidak hanya akan berinteraksi dengan para pengajar, tetapi juga dengan para tokoh nasional dan internasional, praktisi, serta para CEO dan jajaran direksi di dalam kelompok usaha Bakri. Saya memilih Universitas Bakri karena dihadapkan dengan dua pilihan, apakah mau menjadi seorang followers atau menjadi seorang leaders. Dan saya memilih untuk menjadi seorang leaders. Universitas Bakri membekali saya kualitas pendidikan yang luar biasa dari para dosen, dan ini yang menjadikan saya seorang entrepreneur sejati. 
berlokasi di lingkungan yang sangat strategis. Terletak di epicentrum kota Jakarta, semakin meningkatkan mobilitas dan kesempatan para mahasiswa untuk merasakan pengalaman langsung berinteraksi dengan beragam stakeholders. Universitas Bakri juga menunjang pembentukan karakter dengan nilai profesional, caring, dan inovatif. Dengan unit kegiatan mahasiswa yang mengasah keterampilan mahasiswa untuk mengikuti kompetisi pada tingkat lokal, nasional, maupun internasional. Pendidikan yang berkualitas dan menghasilkan para lulusan yang memiliki jiwa kewirausahaan dan inovator yang kreatif tanpa batasan bisa memimpin lapangan pekerjaan di dalam negeri maupun di luar negeri hanya bisa didapatkan di Universitas Bakri. Didasari cita-cita membentuk SDM yang unggul, Universitas Bakri merupakan ekosistem akademik yang mendukung setiap mahasiswanya untuk terus meraih berbagai prestasi dan siap mengantarkan untuk menciptakan inovasi serta solusi bagi Indonesia dan dunia. Universitas Bakri, experience the real things.